Hello and welcome to another ISET Learning Lab. Today we're going, to, we're going to talk about the current engine market challenges and we're going to talk about the market dynamics uh, for more mature engine models and we're going to talk about the challenges facing new gen engines given production delays, reliability issues and constraints in shop visit capabilities and supply chains. To talk about all this, we have two people in the studio today. Uh, we have David Rush, who is uh, Senior Vice President Trading at Ergo Capital. Uh, David has previously worked with uh, KN Aviation Capital as Head of Technical, and he's also worked with Magellan Aviation Group as Director of Sales and Marketing uh, for Europe, Middle East and Africa. He's worked for IBA as a Senior Analyst, and he has a, a business sorry, a Bachelor of Science in, in, in Management and Marketing from the Institute of Technology in Dublin. He's a licensed aircraft engineer under the ESEA Part 66 licensing program. And he's also an ISTEP certified appraiser. Then we have Kane Ray, who is head appraiser for aviation values. And he was previously, before he joined Aviation Values, uh, with the London-based aircraft de Soar, uh, leading its technical department. And he's also been a senior consultant for an aerospace supply chain advisor. Uh, he was also a head analyst at IBA, uh, leading the power plant and component appraisal department. And uh, Kane is also an ISTAT certified appraiser. Now, during uh, Davis and Kane's presentations, uh, you can post questions by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and write in this, those questions. And after the presentations, uh, we will uh, I will go over those questions to the extent we have time. So uh, very welcome, uh, David and Kane. We're going to kick off uh, with David. OK, um, thanks, Nils. And um, thanks, thanks to ISTA for, um, for the opportunity to join this. And um, yeah, it's good to share some opinions with, um, with um, my old colleague and friend, Kane. Um, so we'll, um, yeah, we'll get the ball rolling. Um, I'm, so as, as Nils mentioned, I'm going to spend my time talking about the mature engine market. Um, and then Kane's going to come in and talk about the newer engine types. Um, so it's going to be a lot of crossover. Apologies in advance if we're repeating ourselves. And also, you're um, you're listening to an Irish man and a Liverpoolian. So if we're speaking too quickly, um, apologies about that. Um, but uh, so you know there will be a bit of crossover, and um, yeah, we're looking forward to um, whatever questions you have. Um, in which is a very it's a, a, a very topical point at the moment. Um, so I'll just get into it. I'm just a quick few slides about um, about Ergo Capital. It was established in um, 1999, approximately 6 billion in, um, in asset values across the fleet, over 270 owned and managed assets, burdened by the, um, the acquisition of the Seraph platform last year. Over 60 employees based between Dublin, London, New York, and um, the Middle East. Um, We've closed transactions with over 120 airlines, 90% um, owned by Alibarian St. Carval investors. We've closed transactions in um, a lot of jurisdictions, uh, over 60. And, you know, in, in a fairly turbulent time in the market, we've acquired over 120 assets since January 2021. Um, as I said, 207, over 270 assets in the portfolio, um, quite a diverse fleet. As you can see there, um, over 100 owned and approximately 170 under management. So the, the asset management side of the business is, um, is, is a big focus and has grown a lot in the last 12 months. Um, so with the, with the acquisition of some new tech aircraft in the last, um, the last two years, so some 787, A350 and some 737 Maxes, the, um, the weighted average life of the fleet has come down. Um, and the average fleet term remaining is approximately six years. So, yeah, so let's get into it. Um, so looking at the mature engine market in the third quarter of 2023, um, you know, things are, things are certainly changing, um, you know, and there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, a lot of evolution in the market really. Um, so, you know, the, the, 
various market dynamics going on have brought back a lot of demand for A320 CO and 737NG family aircraft. Um, and you know that's set to increase with um, with continued pressure on the supply chain. Um, we've seen some tightening in terms of what's available out there on the wide body side. You know, particularly on the um, you know on the on the older side on the triple seven and the A330s, as well as the seven six sevens, where we've got prolonged operations with airlines. We've got um, you know lease extensions. Um, you know, there's P2F activity out there as well. And also people looking at these assets and the lower ownership costs that they offer versus um, the, the newer technology, the 787s and the A350s, which Ken will get into a bit later. Um, so I think most of the, um, the consultancy firms and the appraisers forecasted a shop visit peak in the narrow body sector. So this is the 5B, 7B and the B2500, which is most the, the segment I'll be talking about mostly here. I think the, the original shop visit peak was forecasted between 2022 to 2024, 2025. Obviously, COVID had um, a big impact on those numbers. And, you know, the, we're seeing this peak, which is be, being pushed out to, you know, 2024, 2026 and 2027. So, you know, there's, as I'll go into later, there's a lot of engines out there, a lot of shop visits due, but it's, it, they won't necessarily follow the format and the input, let's say, that was originally envisaged. We're gonna see a lot of module swaps, a lot of reduced bills, um, increased use of USM material. So yeah, we'll see a lot of shop visits, but they may not be, they, they may not have the components as originally identified and less performance restorations and overhauls in favor of green time leasing, um, reduced bills and uh, module swaps. So, Obviously the new OEM delivery delays are impacting replacement tech deliveries and the driving interim lift requirements. Um, that's, that's the key factor, you know, that's driving demand at the moment, you know, and um, we're seeing, you know, some positive signs for some of our lessees in terms of um, a reduction in the delivery delays, but it's still an issue that will continue. Into, um, I saw there was, a, there was a poll recently done and I think most people were seeing some level of recovery in the supply chain in 2025. Um, so shop visit avoidance is, um, is driven by revised lease, lease strategies. A lot of operators having to come to lessors relatively last minute and extend leases or have prolonged operation of aircraft. Um, and this is feeding into this demand where you're, you may have to go out and source engines in order to, to build out a particular lease or um, look, do part out exchanges, et cetera. So, it's certainly an increasing trend at the moment, which is feeding a lot of the demand for particularly the narrow body engines. Um, OEM escalation, escalation rates, um, you know, obviously into double digit figures last year from the two major OEMs. And, um, you know, we can anticipate something similar this year. So that's driving a lot of part out decisions whereby you're realizing that part out value a little bit earlier in the life cycle. And it's a trade off. OK, do I, do I put an engine through this shop or do I elect to go to part out? Um, the weary topic of, 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 um, of PMA has popped up again. Um, it seems like for, for a few years that, you know, we'd, we'd, we weren't, we were hearing less and less of, of, um, of PMA due to the, the volume of USM material in the market. But I think, you know, to get around these MRO tailbacks, I think a lot of people are, you know, looking maybe at PMA again and, you know, and look for any, any opportunity to reduce um, repair shop lag times and um, and you know try and get engines through the shop. Um, again, it's, it'll be mostly focused on non-critical path items. Um, wide body trading values are you know can, the, the the wide body engine trading values are coming back up, but they continue to be significantly below the double digit shop visit figures that you know we regularly see on the white body engines you know without even having to look at LP replacements so um but values are coming back up and supply on the market is tightening okay i don't know if there's anything you want any comments you have there or anything you want to raise yeah no comments specific david i think it, you know you touched on sort of the different aspects of engines and lease extensions that it'd be interesting to get your view on where you see sort of narrow body old tech engine lease rates today across the build standards so from sort of tech insertions select ones non-select engines and where you see that market at the moment i think from my point of view it's been fairly homogeneous lease rate so it'd just be interesting to see whether you're seeing any tick up 
in the lease rates? Yeah, well, there's, there's definitely um, a divergence between lease rates for baseline engines and for tech insertion select, you know, the upgraded models. And that was a that was a, a theme that came that seemed to be coming apparent in the last 12 to 15 months. Um, so you know, you're still looking at you know in the low 50s for let's say mid trust by P slash P engines, whereas tech insertion and PIP engines, you know, were probably pushing above 60k. And on the 7B side, you know, high trust baseline 7B, that's engine, that's a fairly balanced market at the moment. And um so you're looking at maybe low 60s and baseline engines and potentially up into the 70s on the tech insertion and evolution models where supply is really, really tight. Um, so just taking a look at the um, the the um, the mature and narrow body market, um, specifically breaking down into the engines a little bit. Um, narrow body storage rates remain high despite the demand due to MRO backlog, slower recovery in Asia and some of the Russia groundings. Still an overhang from COVID there in terms of getting aircraft reactivated and back into service. Um, there was obviously increased aircraft retirements during COVID, a lot of a lot of part activity, a lot of consignment activity, um, a lot of you know end of life players in the market taking advantage of you know lower values, a bit of distress even on you know even on the you know what are now high demand narrow body engines and um you know a lot of a lot of part out activity um a kind of a short term view of you know asset owners looking to generate cash um so we're still feeling the effects of that and it's one of the reasons that the shops are still backed up um so yeah we have those that overhang from covid storage programs and you know those reactivation issues exacerbated by supply chain problems um lower capacity aircraft and demand is lagging higher sea count options and this has been reflected in the engine market. Like that oversupply is in, you know, the low low to mid trust baseline, you know, the older spec engines, um, where there's still a bit of a bit of recovery to get back to pre-COVID numbers. And um, so those those um, I guess those lease rates are probably 10 to 15 percent below where they were pre-COVID. Um, some signs of softness in the P2F market, um, as we're seeing that whole capacity returning, um, and maybe a bit of softness in the, the underlying demand for package freight, et cetera. Um, but there's challenges here in terms of, you know, identifying donor aircraft given the underlying, le underlying levels of passenger demand. Um, obviously these supply chain issues are feeding into conversion costs as well. So uh, from an engine leasing standpoint, you know, it may be the case that those utiliza the utilization profiles that the freighter operators give you, it, does, it doesn't necessarily hold up from what you're recovering in maintenance reserves versus the passenger operations. I think, and, and Kane, maybe you want to touch on this, um, the appraisers have certainly narrowed the gap between market and base values on narrow body engines, um, you know, compared to, compared to where we were, you know, 15, 18 months ago, um, where, you know, I saw one appraiser recently is actually, they think their 7B26 values, market values have gone above base which, you know, is a trend we hadn't seen in a while. Um, so, yeah, Kane, any thoughts on any of the yeah. topics here? Yeah, I, I agree with you, David. And I think, you know, notably, I think you can link that to the favoured engine thrust ratings. And again, going back to your point about the later tech surge and the evolutions, the select ones, et cetera, I'd say that's certainly a trend, trend that I'm seeing in the market at the moment. So, yeah, highly agree with that. Yeah, okay, and on to the next slide. Again, talking about focusing on the 5B, 7B and the B2500 market. Um, these engines are typified by, particularly on the CFM side, by a wide, diverse operator base and pursuant to that, a range of MRO providers. It's, it seems to be a fairly accessible market in terms of you know, setting up shop with them. You know, If you've got an MRO and you wanna set up a product line, um, we've seen some independent providers Aero Norway, notably in the last few years, and the success they've had going up against the more established operator affiliated MROs and the larger MROs and indeed the, the, the OEM network itself. Um, we've got those, as I touched on before, those upgraded engine models exhibit, exhibiting value premium versus baseline variants. Um, and, you know, fundamentally across this fleet, you know, this, despite the, you know, this talk of maturity and, you know, part additive and et cetera, 50% of the engines and above have yet to have their first heavy shop visit. So it's a quite some strange dynamics in the market. 
Um, you look at the 5B and the 7B, you've got some mod modularity in terms of what you can do in the shop visit options. And um, you know, we're seeing the engine lessors also trading out legacy leases in favor of LEAP and GTF sale leaseback activity, where you know a lot of narrow lease rate factors, which doesn't really suit every investor. Um, so we just like I think you know the there's always been this debate between you know the, the 737NG and its single engine 7B option versus what it the Airbus pursuing. Um a, a split option in terms of going down, choosing five Bs or choosing V25 and A5s. And both engines give off, you know, they, they, they both have their advantages uh, versus one another. And you've got indeed some operators who operate both engines in significant numbers. But um, at the 5B, that engine is dominates on the A319 and the A320 CO base. And indeed on the A319, it's probably led to a bit of oversupply in you know low low trust um, slash P engines at the moment, um, whereas the V twenty five hundred is now taking advantage of that H V twenty one market demand where it's got sixty percent of market share. Five B offers you mature shop visit optionality with module swaps and an abundance of um, spare parts availability and crossover from earlier earlier iteration engines, whereas the V twenty five hundred's got quite high mature maintenance costs. Um, and that's something that we're seeing at the moment, which is kind of being exacerbated by the OEM escalation rates. Um, 5B has got a wide, diverse MRO base, whereas the V still a little bit narrower OEM and large MRO centric. So, so, uh, guys like guys like MTU and Lufthansa Technic um, have a dominant position outside of the of the, um, the, the the OEM network, which is quite well established. Um, on the 5B, the later models offer some fuel, some digital single digit fuel burn savings. So the tech insertion engine and the PIP engine, whereas the V2500, and you know, it goes back to its how well it sits on the A321. We've got longer, higher density operations. It does have that fuel burn advantage over the 5B, which is which is quite key at the moment. And the 5B's got quite a reliable, mature maintenance profile where the V2500 has had a lot of high profile airworthiness directives in the last 15 years or so, most notably the stage three to eight drum, and most recently the hub issue, which drove a lot of engine removals. So um, just focusing on a 7B, I think you know the younger average age of the 737NG has led to a, and the max issues has led to a slower um, transition from the NG to the MAX um, than we would have seen from the CO to the NEO. And that's leading to a lot of demand. There was a lot of high percentage of engines that were an aircraft that were delivered post-2014. And those aircraft are still quite young. So you see less kind of part out activity on young 737 NGs than you would on the A320COs. Um, and you know that's given Still, there's still a bit of value premium there in terms of what you see on 7B lease rates versus 5Bs and V2500s. But the single engine choice, which I mentioned earlier, has always been a benefit on the residual value side. Um, and it's, it's, um, you know, it's helped with accessibility to engines from um, leasing pools, et cetera. And it's still, you know, outside of the LEAP and GTF, it's still the, the favorite engine of the, the, the mainstream lessors. Um, and, you know, it's a very reliable engine. Um, you know, we see, I don't know what the exact percentage is, but we see engines regularly running to the core limiter on their first run, which is 20,000 cycles. Again, feeds into that part out versus on release versus reinvest decision. So um, yeah, double digit OEM escalation rates are, um, are driving part out demand on these three engine types. Um, that's, that's quite, you know, <laughs> It, it gives you a decision maybe earlier in the life cycle process than you would have liked in terms of what to do with engines and you know the, the parts demand out there is pretty is pretty intense if you've got a good LLP profile. Um, again, th these engines, despite this wide um, network of 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 um, MROs, we're seeing a lot of slot delays, MRO congestion, and these lease extensions driving green time demand. Um, there is, you know, the, the the I guess there's a premium in engines if you know your candidate has, your 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 candidate engine has some maintenance free utility be that LLP life remaining or EGT margin remaining you know and this is you know on these three types this is quite key at the moment um you know if you're getting an engine that's going to give you three to four years of ops 
and some predictability in terms of um, no shop visits, then you know those engines are fetching a premium on the market. Um, lease terms often on the green time side, driven by LLP limits or EGT margin exposure. So it's a fairly simple, straightforward process, and the return conditions that you know stakeholders are looking for are fairly minimal. Um, we see operators exiting or renegotiating long-term MRO agreements um, with their independent MRO providers or the OEMs as they look for more flexibility and more um, you know, flexibility to have time and material inputs into their, their engine life cycle. Just touching on the, the CFM 56-3C1, which is a, a venerable old engine, and you know, you're looking at lease rates and they haven't really moved that much in the last 10 years, and it's having a bit of a another Indian summer as as you know as the um the that underlying level of 737 classic P2F demand continues and you know without that market will eventually run its course and um, so serviceable engines are fetching the premium in the market similar to the RB211535 and the PW2000 as fitted to the 757. Um, again a lot of the lease demand being driven by 757 um, cargo conversions and the odd prolonged operation of passenger aircraft. But, you know, you're eventually going to get to a point where the market starts running out of serviceable engines and do you put engines through the shop or not when, you know, you're not really sure on how long that program is going to be in demand for. Okay, I feel like there's a lot of information there, but anything you want to add? Yeah, no, I'd, again, on the, on the 3C1, I'll start with first. I definitely echo that. I think the back end of last year, you know, seeing values for sort of 5,000 cycle engines around, you know, 1.4, 1.5 million. But certainly, you know, in the last few weeks, I've had a few conversations where, you know, ask prices are certainly creeping closer to the 2 million mark for similar cycle life engines. I think there is a little bit of difference in that market. So dependent on where the engine might have been maintained previously. And I think there would be a preference for certain MRO facilities in that space. The RB211535, again, I agree with your comments, um, and particularly, you know, sort of link it to the Dash 3 about values not really changing for a significant period of time. You know, I, you know, I, I remember putting our half-life market values on RB211s, must have been sort of seven to 10 years ago, and not much has changed really. And I think there has been some instances as well of engines going through or having to go through the shop due to sort of a shortage of, of engines in the market too. So again, I yeah. agree with that. I have a, 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 a short question as well, David, which may be helpful for the audience. And that's, you mentioned um, sort of CFM's 56-5Bs and 7Bs reaching uh, sort of that HPC, HPT 20,000 cycle limiter for the first run. How are people dealing with the LPT? Is the additional work scope there, given that you've got the 25,000 cycles? Um, or is this something, yeah. you know, does, is it a yeah. bit of a spike? Or? I, well, I think, I think there is module, modular demand is quite high at the moment. So if you come into an engine with, um, you know, if you're electing to part, part the engine out, then you've got that standalone module, um, you know, you've got modular life in the fan and modular life in the LPT, which gives people, you know, job visit cost reductions and, you know, also gives the um, departo players some, you know, additional value, which may not have been realized before. Um, and, you know, I guess on the fan, it does give you decision on, on what your rebuild life is going to be like on, on, on the LLPs. But yeah, it's certainly given some optionality and some additional, additional revenue, given that demands for, for modules and obviously we saw um, a couple of entities in the last few years who've set up like modular MRO light businesses where you know they're specializing in selling modules but also doing those modular life extensions and it's quite cost effective. Um, to, just out of interest day would be for yeah. just another question now you know what you know if you're you know sort of the build of those engines let, let's say it's going to be more short term what what is the yeah. idea term is it sort of still the 8000 9000 10000 cycles i think you know, so yeah 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 i think so certainly on a 5b and a 7b i think maybe less on the v um yeah. and you know you can you know that cutoff point i think for for llp the llp sweet spot mm -hmm. is probably like 6000 cycles on the v which reflects you know the lowest build level 
and maybe on the five B and seven B, it's like six and a half thousand, seven thousand cycles. So that yeah, that reflects what your what your build your, your minimum build levels in the market are going to be. Maybe some guys who would do less, um, but uh, yeah, I think that's yeah, that's a good question. I think I think it's it's maybe again given some life, given some value back where you may not have seen value before in these lower life remaining LPs. Yeah, no, that that that's great. I mean, it, again, it's just something something I've come across in conversations I I'd had, and perhaps yeah, with, with an eye on the future, you know, some entities may be reserving five thousand cycle limit components with an eye on the future. Yeah. To, sort of shorter build engines which again sort of feeds into mature engines such as the dash three that you just mentioned and you know those build scopes can be working into yeah. the future but no thanks for that exactly yeah yeah no bother um just we touch on the mature wide body engine market which is demonstrating some of the sim similar trends to to what we've seen on the narrows and uh, you know but maybe lagging it a little bit i'll get into um the uh the A330 CO, focus on that a little bit in terms of what's going on with the engines there. Um, again, mature stops of the costs are more pronounced against you know that value curve that you know traditional 80 to 90 percent of an air, a mature aircraft value is kind of buried in the engines. But you're getting to a point now where you know the, where a lot of these classic wide bodies are in their life cycle that you know these engine shop visit costs have a big kind of later life impact on it's a big value decision to be made there essentially on you know whether you want to put an engine through the shop versus the inherent value of the, the host aircraft. Um, shop visit avoidance deferral is, is really key at the moment. Um, and that's what's driving driving up a lot of the spare engine demand. Um, there's some, you know, as I mentioned with the narrow bodies, some um you know, evidence of declining OEM life cycle control a bit more diversity in terms of what you can get your engines and where you can where you can go to um you know on the on the the, the MRO side as well um some reduced reliability as um as engine programs age um you know I think a a lot of aircraft and engines coming out of those COVID storage programs with um you know coming coming back out with issues when they're going into sh when you know and kind of unscheduled shop visits etc. And um, particularly from harsh environment operations, um, don a lot of donor aircraft, which maybe had been earmarked for P2F conversion, are being consumed by passenger operations now. As you know, lessors are looking to extend leases in the face of delivery delays, which are there on the wide bodies as they are on the narrow bodies. Um, hence, yeah, so hence a bit of oversupply on the wide body um, and freighter side, um, and you know some some fleet decisions lately, which are feeding that. Um, on the CF6-80C2 and the 94, demand's kind of solely being driven by um, prolonged 767 and, you know, some 74 and 767 um, white body freighter demand during COVID. Um, and, you know, just, there's actually been, you know, some trading activity on those aircraft amongst the lesser community lately. Um, but yeah, the CF6-80C2 and the 40 PW 4060 in particular, um, very tight in terms of spare engine availability, and you know those engines are um, are kind of fetching a value premium as a result. So we step into the the A330 engine market and have a bit of a look at it. Um, and that's this is an area where Ergo is obviously playing um, widely, and um, you know particularly with Trent powered A330s. Um, but there's um you know there's three three engine options on the A330. We call it the A330CO, um, and it'd be the Trent 700, the Pratt & Whitney 4,100-inch engine, and the CF6-80E. Um, so the, the, I guess the, the, the Trent 700 is the dominant, um, the dominant um, engine in this segment. I remember when I joined, uh, when I joined IBA um, in 2000 and 2008, um, I think the split was around 40% in favor of the Trent 700 and then 30% across the, the other two engines. Um, and then a lot of aggressive selling by Rolls and in the in the, in the, latter, the latter half of the A330 production cycle um, drove up the, the population on the Trent 700 a lot. And obviously Rolls were able to offer comprehensive aftermarket packages. And indeed they turned some operators who would have been Pratt and CF6 away from, from 
um, operating those engines to you know placing orders for Trent powered aircraft. Um, but um, it's so it's got a, it dominates the, the market share. And indeed, on the Trent 700, we're starting to see a bit of liberalisation in terms of you know sourcing engines. Um, there are other there you know it's not just a case of the OEM dominating market supply. You've got some other entities now out there who are operating who are offering engines outside of um, roles, you know, um, total care programs. Um, looking at CF6 80E, it's got the lowest mature maintenance costs of any of the engines. Um, and but it, you know, it's maybe suffered a little bit in the last few years in that it didn't, it has quite a narrow operator base and GE didn't go forward with a CF6 80E freighter option. And on the P2F side, as far as I'm aware, there hasn't been a CF6 powered aircraft identified for freight conversion, but I'm happy to be um, informed on that one. Um, but we're seeing the operator base widening these three engine types as some second and tertiary tier operators get into A330s. Um, but from the part perspective, you know, there's some, some um, savings to be made on the CF6 and the PW4000 in that you've got access to parts commonality from older engines in those programs. And, you know, they've, they've, there's crossover with the CF6-80C2 and some of the other trust build PW4000s. Um, but um, yeah, you'll see storage levels are quite high. Um, you know, that's a lot of that is driven by, you know, aircraft that haven't had engines removed and a lot of COVID overhang and a lot of aircraft basically waiting for maintenance slots and to get into new operators and still a bit of softness in, in the market. Um, so um, this is, yes, yeah, my final slide. Um, just thought I would, you know, talk a little bit about the dynamics we're seeing, you know, particularly on the narrow body side and what that's do, you know, what the optionality that you have now when you get to a shop visit and what's that that's likely to do to the maintenance profile of an engine and indeed the economic profile of an engine. So um, some of you may be familiar with this is the, 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 saw, the sawtooth graph, which um, kind of outlines, you know, the, the maintenance profile of an aircraft over time. So have your met, you have your metal value, which is the thick line there. And then you've got your maintenance buildup value, which is the kind of the, the shaded green on the, the X axis. And then your full life value, which is like this theoretical um, appraisal term, which reflects your, your aircraft with its full maintenance utility. So this the the, the key point here that you you've got to look at is the um, is the um, the this step here which takes place around one to one hundred and twelve, which would be you know correspond with some some engine um, shop visits and your hypothetically your twelve year check. Um, where you know you've got this big maintenance cost outlay, you've got some shop business, you've got some LMPs to replace, but there is options in the market at the moment in terms of you know how you can reduce that cost. Um, so this point here is where you know you're seeing your most significant maintenance spend, um, and a lot of leases would kind of would would run in tandem with this time frame in the aircraft life cycle. So. Here you've got the options now where you can look at green time leasing um, in order to, I guess, um, monetize those engines from the from from a um, part out perspective. Um, you can go straight to part out, or you can look at module swaps, particularly on the five B and seven B side. So you know this availability of engines in the market is is given some, you know, some options, and indeed Ergo has had um, operators approaches recently about lease extensions. And, you know, we've got to look at those options in terms of, you know, where the engines are in their life cycle, you know, what we'd forecasted in terms of returns and, you know, what we want to look at, you know, what, what's the market like for, for green time engine supply. So um, I think it's just, you know, interesting to look at this from the perspective of a little bit of a changing, a few changes and a bit of optionality out there in terms of what you can do with your engines and your maintenance spend. Okay, the ones that's anything you want to jump in there on before I um before I hand over to you? Yeah, I think a couple of things, David. I think I'll stick to this chart to begin with. You know, are there any mm -hmm. engines where sort of 
those trends are predominant. And going back to your previous slide, yeah. are you seeing any engine portfolio availability in the market? And what's the typical composition of the engines? Obviously, I'd expect it to be weighted more towards narrow body, but you know, just being yes, sad. yes, there is. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think, mm -hmm. you know, there is a lot of 5B, 7B, and the B2800 mm -hmm. trades out there. So you've got some of the established engine lessors, and let's say some of the Japanese backed engine lessors who are turning their focus to leaps and GTFs. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they're, they're looking to, you know, take advantage of some of the, you know, the attractive pricing out there for 5Bs and 7Bs and do a bit of downselling. You've also got the OEMs engaging in some of that activity as well. But we see some GE90 115s popping up as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, where Ergo sits, you know, we're not really in the market for the, you know, the, the, the leap, the leap and GTF engines, you know, a lot of the lease rate factors are quite specific to where some of those larger and indeed Asian backed um, engine lessors can trade. But, you know, there is a lot of, of activity in, in that space and, you know, some, some decent, I guess, decent stub, li stub lease and lease extension opportunities as well there, which, you know, maybe gives us some optionality in terms of what we can do with our own fleet. Um, yeah, so I think, I think, yeah, there is some, some evidence of GE90s, um, some, some funky values out there as well, which I, I know you're aware of. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think the, <laughs> the um, yeah, certainly the 5B and the 7B and the V25 are 100, they're accessible engines for, for most market players. And I think that's where a lot of the trading is going to come. Oh, that's um, great. Yeah. So, yeah, um, I'm not sure if there's anything you wanted to touch on this slide, Kane, or like other than, you know, your, your, your question earlier, which engines are this more suitable? I think the 5B and 7B is where this is more yeah. suitable because you, you've got that flexibility and you've got that modular life. Um, I think the V as well, you know, with that 20,000 cycle LLP limit and, you know, shop visit kind of happening at once, um, you know, depending on how you've built the engine, you know, that there's, there's, you know, a big decision to be made there and whether, whether one decides to reinvest or not. Yeah, so is it more of a challenge? I mean, I know we took, clearly we've worked together and we've had these discussions and we've probably butted heads on it in the past, but is it more of a challenge with the V to obtain, you know, certain life build LLPs to, you know, run a shorter time on wing it, just because of those yeah. Yeah. cycles? Yeah. Yeah. I think because of the profile of the engine and, yeah, you'll always find, you will find engines out there with mixed builds because of all the ADs I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um, but those those LLPs are probably more readily available than any, because if you do go and park out an engine, you typically will have mismatch in, you know, life remaining with, you know, the, the AD impacted LLPs. Yeah. But yeah, it is tough to find, you know, a good kind of stack of LLPs out there with that optimal life remaining. That's great, thank you. Okay. So thank you very much, um, Kane. I'll hand over to you, and you. Um, we can we can uh, get into the newer engine types. Right. So let's, uh, so you can see my screen. Um, thank you for the introduction there, David. Um, it's not um, it's not often people refer to me as a Liverpoolian, but it's good to hear again. Um, and don't expect sort of a different language saying thank you at the end of my presentation. I'm not that talented, but uh, <laughs> it's just English here. In so we're going to discuss the new uh, new tech engine market today. Um, we'll cover the likes of the Pratt Whitney 1100 GTF, 1500, 1900 GTF uh, with the Leap 1A, 1B, and to an, a certain extent the 1C. Um, I'll group these together. I think for comparison comparative purposes, it will largely focus on the A320 Neo engines uh, today but it's applicable to the others as well. But firstly, I'll just get into a little bit about aviation values. So we were launched this year, um, in May this year, when we split out of our former pairing company, Vessels Value, a maritime asset appraisal specialist. Uh, we have four officers worldwide, over 50 people, comprising of two ISTAT appraisers, analysts, marketing, and fleet data researchers. Development on our appraisal and fleet data platform commenced in 2019. Our focus is on the provision of aircraft values, fleet data, and activity. Uh, unlike others, 
Our valuation service is an automated value model or regression. It relies on appraisers such as myself, as some of my colleagues and analysts researching transactions in the market, which then project and provide half-life, full-life market base and soft values to our customers. Um, these adhere to ISTAT principles and come with all of the ISTAT definitions. We also su provide supporting transactions. So anything that isn't so sensitive and has been researched and is available in the public domain, we give you supporting transactions linked to the values that we produce. Um, and equally, we provide activity data, MSN specific, uh, which essentially provides you with stoppages and journeys, which then accumulate into flight hours and flight cycles for each MSN available within the wide body and narrow body sector. So firstly, we'll start with the narrow body new tech engine market today. So the GTF and the leaps. Yeah, um, your presentation is not uh, beamed on the screen. Uh, okay. I think you have to share your screen. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, is this being shared? No. No? Yeah. Yeah, there we go, okay. okay. Your adults of tones were enough for me, to be honest, but... Uh... Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> well, well, I don't know why that was, but we've... But yeah, here's the, the opening few slides for those who missed them. So, on to the narrow-body new tech engine market today. Uh, and I've split this into sort of pros and cons. And we'll start with the positives uh, relating to the CFM leap and GTF market. So noise improvements, I think, you know, this has been a significant play on for, for both the engine types and particularly, uh, you know, for large airlines who have perhaps had the previous tech engines in their fleet. Uh, it satisfies airport requirements and is, is certainly a reducer in direct costs. Fuel burn improvements, as you would expect. Um, is one of the key drivers of new engine technology and more coming as well. So in the next line, you can see the GTF advantage. Here we have, again, a future fuel burn benefit and advantage, not only over the current PW 1100, 1500 and 1900 engines, but equally, again, the 5Bs, the 7Bs and the B2500s of old. Another positive, particularly when comparing the LEAP 1A versus the Pratt & Whitney 1100 is the active fleet status of the CFM LEAP. And yes, it is, you know, seven years since EIS, but, you know, compared to the GTF, the LEAP is performing better in active service, uh, as we'll see in the next slide. The CFM LEAP 1C, which powers the, C, the COMAC C919, is is now active as of last year. I believe there are two in active service with one awaiting activity. So that's six engines. Um, also an increasing MRO service networks. And I think this also links into some of the negatives that we'll touch on, but there's a push from CFM and Pratt and & Whitney to increase the license network of maintenance, repair and overhaul providers. CFM have got ambitions to increase this to 20 and Pratt and & Whitney, I believe, a recent announcement was seven, an increase of seven. They already have existing 12, which you know makes 19. So comparable service networks. And hopefully this will help weed out some of the EIS issues that have been seen regularly in the media. A couple of points uh, of note, the GTF gearbox has been a durable um, entry into service technology. It was perhaps the most radical change for any of the engines at the time, and today still is as well. There's no other offering like it. Um, again, this has not posed any issues as far as I'm aware. And engine lease rates have been quite strong. This does link into some of the issues that the engines have been seeing. Um, and I think this is prevalent on the GTF. I think presently you probably expect maybe 10 to 20% more lease rental on a GTF than you might do on a LEAP 1A or a LEAP 1B. So some of the negatives, and I think the underlying factor, and I suppose how you know, owners, asset operators, asset owners, operators may judge the new tech engines is the time on wing. And it's simply relating and referring back to the old tech engines that David had mentioned. Simply today and since EIS, they don't compare favorably. Now, I think, you know, clearly, 
you know, it does take time and there is clearly a, you know, a mature repair network with the older tech engines that's been developed and is supporting those engines, which in turn helps increase the time on wing. But today, you know, I think we probably expect it to be, uh, you know, achieving better times on wing than it currently is. However, these EIS improvements and retrofits, retrofits have been ongoing, um, but particularly with the GTF, it just seems that, you know, Pratt & Whitney can't catch a break uh, with this engine. It does seem to be one thing after another. There was a, an announcement last week, for instance, by where there's going to be a large number of engines needing inspections in a short space of time, and this will just add to the backlog and, you know, potentially more aircraft on ground. Uh, added to this supply chain constraints, getting components to shops to retrofit these engines needing repairs, fixes and any on, the, on some of these issues. Um, you know, when you've got these engines in shop, this also applies to the Leap 1A as well. You know, if you're opening up sort of the core of an engine, the likelihood is that there could be some maintenance work scope creep too. So you have to build in you know, more time, more downtime in the shop for these engines. And I think this is, you know, a common practice at present. You've got longer turn times and you've got engines waiting, you know, within the shop induction. You also haven't got enough spare engines to support um, aircraft. And, you know, this is leading to some storage, particularly on the Pratt & Whitney powered A320 NEO aircraft. Again, David mentioned component escalation earlier, and this is certainly a factor um, in the new tech engines as well. And I think, you know, sort of taking into account time on wing and, you know, projections on the cost per engine flight hour, these, this is another sort of area we're seeing increases in. And I think asset owners are building this into lease agreements, um, you know, sort of warranting those additional costs that these engines are presently inflicting. So David, I think I don't think you want to comment on anything there, or happy to carry on. I'll carry on. Um, probably be some okay. questions at the end of this slide. Yeah, no bother at all. So you know, I think we all we also have to bear in mind that you know these engines, although it is seven years on, they did enter service as a new engine option on an established A three twenty CO and seven three seven NG platform with pretty hefty production rates with you know a transition time that was quite short you know you know all things being considered you you can sort of look at the 737 ng and max crossover there was certainly some lag there for you know obvious reasons and then there was the ensuing covid period but still it was a you know a ramp up and a challenge for the OE, engine oems to deal with and i think there's been many moving parts that have you know particularly with the engine issues sort of going full swing by where you know you've got to feed a production line you've got to build spares to support the fleet that perhaps is requiring some fixes there's then the retrofits themselves and then there's you know engine manufacturers are always trying to improve the engines and they're trying to get as much out of it as possible so for instance the advantage cfm recently announcing uh, the Paris Air show that there'll be some hardware upgrades within the core of the CFM Leap engine, uh, particularly to support harsh environments. So, it, it, you know, nothing ever stops. And equally, you know, to feed all of the all of all of these sort of supply chains, if you like, is particularly difficult. And you can see on the right hand side, you know, some of the challenges that you know the OEMs face, particularly with engines that are on stored stored aircraft or as it may be not on the stored aircraft awaiting uh, maintenance induction. I think one good point I also came across from discussions, you know, with some people in the market is that, you know, today, if we look back to sort of times of the 737 Classic and even the entry into service of the original A320 CO, you know, fewer airlines today, perhaps because of the airline model, more low cost airlines, the, the, cap the in-house capabilities are not quite what they were with the traditional airlines, the legacy airlines, and there's a greater reliance on outsourcing. So I think there's a, you know, a question of knowledge and just capability within to perform, you know, even the minor uh, maintenance on certain engines. 
Um, so yeah, just a few concluding points on the LEAP and Pratt & Whitney GTF. Uh, the OEMs are answering the market with increases to the existing MRO network. And again, reiterating the point David made earlier, I think for you know, robust growth, airlines are still and maintain uh, you know, their old tech uh, craft leases through extensions, through just trades within the market, open trades. So I think they're propping up their fleets with you know, some of the older tech. Okay, and um, Kane, just a um, couple of observations or questions um, on, you know, the, the what you've talked about in this slide. Um, so if you look at the look at the five B, for instance. And now I'm going back to the old engines, but look at the five B pre-COVID. So you had the there was a HPT front air seal AD, which drove a lot of um, load of load drove a lot of shop demand and a lot of engines in, into inspection into the shop and that um as a result cfm actually you know built it was built a lot of engines relatively late in the life cycle yeah. um and you know values values in like 2018 2019 and on the 5b and lease rate demand was going through the roof um you know even on lower trust engines and then suddenly cfm got their head around the problem and you know that demand kind of tailed off pretty quickly and there was some value diminution you know quite you know quite quickly yeah. and then this was a this is a factor that then tracked into covid so you know a, a lot of it is you know and a lot of this was driven by the fact that cfm were trying to you know deal with the problem and they you know they built a lot of engines and suddenly there's a surplus in the market um can we see that happening maybe in the next few years or you know maybe a little bit further out, you know the OEMs will will get their heads around the issues that they're having, and mm -hmm. and they've had some successes so far. But can we see some value pressure due to you know maybe a little bit of oversupply out there? And particularly if we talk about you know yeah. touching the advantage engine there and the yeah. you know the, the upgrades that CFM are doing on the leak, um, that you know we could see some value divergence as well with those with those engines because we're seeing that at the moment on the 5B. And we saw in a V back, you know, after the three to eight drum issue, there was there was um, you know, a lot of engines built then, and values softened a bit. I think you know on the on the leap first, David. I think the the issues, you know, you know, they're well documented, but perhaps less severe and less frequent. I think the upgrade, the, the more recent upgrades, is I would say you know fairly typical of an engine entering into service. It's perhaps reactive to their experience in a particular environment. However, on the GTF, I think the question is more relevant, particularly because you have the advantage and if the advantage becomes the production standard and if Pratt & Whitney is producing spare engines to supplement shortages at the moment in fleet, bear in mind these aren't advantage engines. I think the question becomes how long you're producing those spare engines to supplement the initial Pratt and Whitney 1100 G fleet, for instance. You know, if you cross over mm -hmm. to the Advantage and you've, you're left with a surplus of spare engines, which is over and above over and above the typical, you know, what we've been used to in sort of previous tech engines of let's, you know, let's say sort of six to twelve percent. If we looked at you know, sort of the best seven Bs to the worst B2500s, you know, just for instance. You know, I think, you know, there's certainly a valid question there. I suspect it depends on when those spurs are produced to and what Pratt and Whitney can reduce that spurs count to. I mean, if you're if the GTF advantage, you know, comes into service next year and that becomes the standard and is supplied to the production line and you're left with these spare engines, what do you do with them? I think history has told us that this would lead to some value pressure, particularly for the markets that you just mentioned. Um, and I think that applies, you know, particularly around the sort of 2010, 2011, 2012 period with the 5B, 7Bs, V2500s, you know, give or take, um, sort of stretching my mind quite far back, but uh, in and around that period, I think, you know, there were instances of that then too. So, yeah, I think... Okay. Yeah, you know, latterly on the 5B, I, I guess it's a little different, you know, more recent, because I guess the 5B was winding down. 
uh, sort of around, you know, prior to COVID, you sort of, you know, I think sort of later deliveries, sort of 2021, 22 into Delta, if memory serves me correct, I, I forget. But uh, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, that's, that would be my answer to it. Okay, thanks very much. Right, I'll just... You're all done. It's all right. So moving forward onto some of the wide body engines, and we'll start with the Rolls-Royce Trent 7000, which powers the A330neo. Uh, the Dash 800 and the Dash 900, and the Trent 1000 TEN. Uh, for listeners who aren't aware, these engines are effectively the same. They do uh, use a different bleed air, or one uses a bleed air system for the cabin. Um, the focus of Rolls-Royce has been time on wing improvements and reducing, reducing maintenance man hours, um, particularly for the Trent 1000 family of engines. The Trent 7000 has a new HPT blade aimed at improving durability. Um, it's entered service with Kuwait Airways and is now the production standard. The Trent 1000 TEN is yet to receive this HPT blade upgrade, um, but it is due later this year. Um, this will be incorporated over a period of you know, two to three years, so it won't be an imminent upgrade. And the benefit of the what is thought to be of at least 2000 cycles on wing or between shop visits will not be realized on the Trent 1000 TEN yet. This should be realized on the Trent 7000 though. I'd also add that the 2000 cycles is dependent on proving in service, but I'm led to believe that, you know, this will be the sort of minimal figure that the HBT blade will achieve on wing. In better news for the Trent 1000 TEN, the IPC blade upgrade, which has been well documented, is very close to a full fleet retrofit. Um, and this has been one of the key drivers in reducing a sort of labor man hour output uh, dedicated to maintenance for this engine. Um, I think another important point, and we'll see this um, when we talk about the XWB in a few slides time, is that you know, Rolls-Royce is focused on MRO network expansion. I think, you know, partly, you know, to reduce sort of downtime or turn times between shop, shop visits. I think, you know, this has really come to the fore in recent times and gets mentioned a lot, but I have to admit that this is something that I remember being around, you know, sort of in, in my later days, IBA, and it, it's certainly something that I, I don't think has changed too much. I think this, you know, not it's not just Rolls-Royce, it's others too. We've seen it, as I mentioned earlier, with Pratt & Whitney and CFM on the leap. There's, you know, there's certainly a push to increase uh, MRO licenses and offerings as to where you can put your engine in for maintenance. So on the right hand side, you can just see a comparison of the Trent 1000 versus the Gen X 1B, the two competing engines on the Boeing 787 family. Uh, this is from 2017, and this is the point at which the Trent 1000 TEN entered service. And this is a lead in to the Gen X 1B slide. And you can see clearly that the Gen X-1B is the favoured engine on the Boeing 787, whether it's the Dash 8, the Dash 9 or the Dash 10, um, it's a very clear picture. And General Electric's message is that, you know, they're powering two out of every three engines uh, under wing of the 787. And you can see on the right hand side that this is more or less true. Uh, even to date, uh, year to date, we've had some strong order activity and campaign wins uh, for GE with the Gen X-1B with Air India, Riyadh Air and China Airlines. And I think, you know, you can look at this engine as perhaps being one of the success stories for a new entrant, even though it's been around for over 10 years now. You know, it has hit targets in terms of time on wing expectations. It did have some early entry into service issues, but much of these or many of these were eradicated with a performance improvement package PIP2 upgrade. And GE has continued to you know, develop this engine and has recently announced uh, the completion of hardware upgrades within the combustor and to the HPT blades. And again, you know, such upgrades you know, are synonymous with time on wing improvements. Just a quick note as well, um, you know, good engine. And it's not to say that, you know, other engines, you know, don't have the same trend, but Gen X-1B engine values have been resilient and have been for some time. 
Okay, and just a, a quick one on that, um, on the Gen X one B. Yeah, and we, yeah. we've we've actually you know seen some engines being offered, you know, yeah, yeah. out um from from the engine, the, like I guess the larger engine lessors um have have offered some engines in RFPs, yeah. but um you know it's it's I guess it's predecessor or it's um which did obviously in operation in large numbers is the G ninety, the one one five and. But how is the 1B being performed in, in harsh environments? You mentioned there the, the campaigns, Air India, Riyadh Air and China Airlines are each going to bring their own challenges in terms of harsh operation. But how how is the engine being performed in? Well, I think there's a, you know, there's, a there's another way of looking at it there, David. You could ask how the other engine has been performing in those regions would be another question, because I think I think the Gen X 1B, you could say you could say it's had it easy. Um, but it's you know the, the nooks and crannies are of it are that it's better you know than the competition. Um, but equally, you know, I remember you know I've sat through you know, quite a few GE appraiser conferences in, in my time, and you know GE, GE did put a, a lot of effort, particularly with the you know tying with Emirates on the GE ninety one one five B into sort of harsh environment, dust ingestion tests, for instance. So, you know, I think, you know, the Gen X-1B is, you know, performing, you know, as it should do in those regions. Clearly, if it's operating in a more benign environment, like most other engines, the expectation would be that it would stay on wing for longer. But yes, yeah, certainly, you know, you know, I'm not, not aware of anything, you know, too severe uh, and certainly okay. better yeah. the competition. But uh, of course, you know, if any members of the audience wish to, you know, to sort of shed any more light on that, I'd certainly be a willing listener. Is that okay, David? Yeah, yeah, perfect, Kane. Thank you. Move forward. So moving on to the Rolls-Royce Trent XWB84, um, powers the A350-900 aircraft, and the XWB97, which powers the Airbus A350-1000 aircraft. Um, I've got a point at the sort of the top here. The engines are different. Uh, they they obviously have similar technologies, but the XWB is a scaled larger uh, version and also has Bliss technologies opposed to the XWB84. I think headline uh, fairly exemplary entry into service performance for the XWB. Um, you know, you look at all the metrics that you know sort of come with engines as, as they go through their life and things such as abortive takeoff rates on scheduled engine removals and as an EIS engine the XWBs have been you know excellent quite frankly. Um, the XWB84 does require an IPC one blade upgrade. I think this really came you know that sort of a few years ago perhaps 2020 uh, with sort of issues linked to Qatar um, based aircraft. Um, and basically, cracks have been found in IPC1 blades, and this continues today. There's an AD inspection program. Uh, so, you know, every 200 cycles at 2,300 cycles, the IPC blade is inspected for cracks. Um, there is a solution being readied um, and an upgrade, which I'm sure we'll hear more from Rolls Royce in future. Um, there was also supposed to be an XWB84 enhancement package, which, you know, could now come later. But I think because of Rolls-Royce commitments to the Trent 1000, you know, not only the TEM, but the package B, package C engines, which required, you know, a series of sort of in-service in fixes, uh, time was dedicated in the after aftermarket to that rather than development of an enhancement package. Um, Another key point, and this also applies to any new entry, you know, or a new tech entry into service engine is increases to LLP limits. I think what you don't want is LLP limits being early drivers of shop visits. And this is certainly a key strategy for the likes of Rolls Royce at present on the XWB. The XWB 97, as mentioned, a scaled and different engine. Uh, it doesn't have the same issues as the 84. Uh, presently, and we hope it doesn't in future either. Um, this year, um, it has had a very encouraging order year off the back of increased wide body order interest. So you can see on the right hand side the table of orders in 2023, year to date, uh, for both the XWB 97 and XWB 84. 
This does not include phrases, um, but yeah, notable ones, Air India, Lufthansa and Philippine Airlines. So I think, you know, from my point of view, uh, despite sort of the EIS performance, which has been, you know, excellent, I think over time and in the next few years, the focus for Rolls-Royce will be on improving, you know, probably with the IPC one blade, the time on wing and proving that in service. You know, today, I think the feeling is that it's not yet comparable to, you know, mature Trent engines such as the Rolls-Royce Trent 700, for instance. So one engine that falls between perhaps new tech and older tech, which David covered, is the GE90 115B or 110-115B on the 777-200LR uh, freighter and 777-300ER. Um, and I think I, I, I use this as a staple, but it's along with the Rolls-Royce Trent 700, I'd say it's the benchmark for the latest technology wide body engines in terms of time on wing. Um, the Trent 700, you know, in some cases limited by its HPC rotor uh, LLP like limiter of 6,000 cycles. I've often heard that in some instances it could go beyond that. Um, you know, the G90 is a consistent and reliable performer in service, which you'd expect for mature engine technology. A challenge, I think, is the maintenance costs associated to the engine, particularly as you get into the mature engine shop visits. You know, you're, you're sort of looking at costs, you know, plus 30 million and up. Um, and I know this has caused, you know, certain challenges, particularly during the COVID period, getting these the aircraft, the host aircraft and engines back into service. And I think there is a demand, as there would naturally be, for cheaper maintenance solutions for effective passenger and freight operations. I think typical time between shop visits, as I alluded to, you know, beats, you know, the majority of new tech wide body engines to date. Um, a touch on values, last 12 months, lease rates and engine values have increased significantly. Um, again, you know, sort of happy to share insights on that. But I think, you know, sort of even in the last few months, I've seen lease rates increase from to above 150,000 per month for G90 115Bs. And now you're looking sort of at what plus $160,000 per month. Um, I think with the, again, you're sort of you're 20, nearly 20 years on with the 777-300ER, uh, so 2004 EIS. Um, and I think you are seeing passenger operators project, projecting fleet retirements. One example is Eber Air. Um, and I think, you know, sort of JAL has, you know, made some noise about it too. Uh, they have, you know, sort of an, an older fleet, I would also add. But again, I, I wouldn't rule out sort of certain, cap, you know, there's caveats that and I wouldn't rule out extensions to service. I think a lot is dependent on some of the new tech engines and the new tech aircraft programs. Uh, such as you know the upcoming 777X. So just a few concluding observations and salient points from the slides that you've seen. Um, so for new tech engines, it's just seemed like it's been one fix after the next. And I think this is particularly true for the Pratt & Whitney 1100G and the Trent 1000 family of engines. Um, however, fuel burn emissions and noise benefits have been proven. And I think in service, this has been a success. Um, there has been a hindrance, particularly in the narrow body sector of production expectations linked to, you know, entry into service issues, just causing a backlog in the, in the shops and therefore AOG situations. However, OEMs do have the clear MRO strategy as we've, as we've touched on. And I think underlying, and you know, this could almost the presentation could almost have been named name this is that time and wing time on wing improvements are essential. Although today they maybe do seem some way off. Proving and certifying LLP ultimate lives is crucial to avoid LLP shop visit drivers. And it'd be interesting to see, you know, you sort of when the supply chain um, sort of eases up and, and if it is what the time frame is on that and is that linked to annual component escalation is that temporary the feeling i get is that it will be but for the time period we're still not sure and again back to david's presentation if you like operators are buying extending and leasing old tech for reliability and in line with their growth projections 
and I think this will continue. And that concludes yeah, just on, the presentation. Yeah, yeah, just, Sorry. yeah thanks very much. I'm just on, Sorry, just on the, G, the G90 slide there. Um, yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, and it, touching on what you were concluding with there. Um, so we've seen an increased volume of part out activity on the G90 side, and, you know, the five or six um, of the parts guys getting into, you know, purchasing these engines and, um, you know, and you've got traditional part out bidders like MTU or there as well. But, you know, when you're talking about those high um, mature shop visit costs, let's say, yep. um, are we seeing evidence or is there any likelihood that it'll be a significant impact on, you know, those shop visit costs? I guess if you get to your LLP limiter, 15,000 cycles or whatever, yeah, sure. But um, like, is there any evidence that we're seeing a kind of a knock on effect that shop visit costs could come down and it could, you know, could come on the program? I mean, again, I'm not, you know, I, one thing I would say, David, is that to my knowledge, I think it is something that GE is certainly looking at. Clearly, the, the engine, the engine MRO network is it's sort of within the confines of GE with, with, an, with an exception. Um, you know, I think, I think, it, you know, really it has to, I think if you've got part of players entering the market, as you mentioned, then that to me points towards cheaper alternatives of maintenance. And I think, you know, that can only become, you know, hopefully the norm, you know, you, you yeah. know, you know, take things in maturity. I think you just do tend to see cost reducing. You look at the CF six eighty C twos. Um, I'm not sure what the stage is with the the CF six eighty E, for instance. But you know, compared to their competition, they've always been seen and G have been seen to be reducing or offering. You know, things such as USM uh, sort of yeah. material, as you mentioned, from part out engines to reduce those shop visit costs. And I think the yeah. G ninety is, is an exception. You know, you think about the list price of this engine, even a few years ago, compared to other wide body engines, and it, it, it just sort of blows them out the water. And, you know, yeah. that's, that's only been rising. The LLPs have only been rising. And, you know, the LLPs you mentioned as well, yes, the, you know, the majority of them are at 15,000 cycles, but there are some that are lower than that. So, bells, yeah. 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 So I think, you know, you, you know, they are a feature. And, you know, I guess... You know, but yeah, you know, I certainly see that as something that perhaps has to happen. And I think it will, I think, and that will prolong, you know, and, and help operators, you know, keep these engines in service. I mean, you, I mean, you know, just a little bit more insight, you know, the way Emirates manage, manages those engines as well. And I know they've got significant scale over others, but, you know, they do a lot of chopping and changing within their within their GE nineties to make it work for them and to keep engines on wing. So yeah. you know, I think that can only be a feature for others too. Okay. Yeah, that's no further questions, Your Honor. Um yeah, good, good way of putting it, David. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, David, you can uh, stop sharing your screen now so we can see you guys a little bigger on the screen. We have a few questions. Uh, so the first question is from Eric Pop, and he's uh, saying, but first of all, he's thanking you for a very interesting talk. Uh, how do you guys foresee the availability of green time on the CFM 56-7B26 engines evolving over the next uh, 24 months? And what about rentals? Um, I think I, th I think it's going to be tight. Um, and it, yeah, it's a very it's a very relevant question, but I think there's going to be continuing tightness. Um, we have, you know, maybe that roll off of engines that we would have seen from, you know, 800s that were coming off lease um, is, is going to be changed a little bit by all the lease extensions that are underway. Um, and I think, you know, the 26, 26k trust engine is where the market is at. And um, so I, I don't see, I don't see any increased availability of engines over the next two years. And, you know, we've got that, um, that shop visit peak that we were talking about, which is going to drive a lot of spare engine demand. Um, so I think, and I think lease rates are going to continue to to trickle up. Um, I think it's a uh, yeah, it's 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 the most you know, and particularly the tech insertion and the evolution models are the most in demand and narrow body engine legacy narrow body engine that there is at the moment. Okay. And another question is, how is Pratt handling the low CH5 LLP limits on the GTF 
particularly the high trust variants. And how are the source and operators being compensated when engines are driven on wing prematurely? Yeah, I think on to, to answer the latter question, I think it's specific to the agreement that you know perhaps the the leasing company, the airline, have with the OEM. I think I certainly think that you know there is there's certainly warranties at play, but I'm not sure if that's for for all. Um, so that would be a good, one point. I think in terms of LLP, um, Pratt has got a program of replenishment of certain LLPs, particularly in the high pressure sections of the HPT, of reaching those LLP limits. Again, this is something you know Pratt at their appraiser conferences have you know made known to appraisers at least. Um, but yeah, it, effectively, it's part in replenishment of parts within the stack and then proving on wing. But to my knowledge, the LLP chapter five limits have increased since entry into service. There are some exceptions, but Pratt has been working through these. Okay. And uh, what do you think about, how long is it gonna take for this new generation engines to reach about the same on, uh, on wing performance as the previous generation? Yeah, it's, it's a good question, Nils. I think, you know, you, you hear so many different versions. I think, you know, I was speaking with David, you know, prior to this, and I think there was an announcement a few months ago from Raytheon that basically prescribed that the GTF could now perform a comparable time on wing to a B2500-A5 of 10,000 flight hours. And I just don't see that as being reflective of the market. And I'm fairly sure David doesn't either. And then there are other instances where you hear of, you know, engines that are not spending much time on wing. Um, you know, I've heard this as recent as last week. Um, I won't quote figures, but let's say it's nowhere near 10,000 flight hours. Um, it might not be for, you know, a full overhaul of the engine, but it's where the engine may require let's say some sort of inspection or hospital visit uh, to, you know, you know, again, to inspect an engine, to perform some sort of repair, uh, some retrofit that's due. So again, you know, my feedback sort of renders it a little dubious, the 10,000 flight hours. How long does it take? You know, I really don't know. I hear of speculative years, um, and they are way out into the future. But I think the answer to that question really lies with Pratt and Whitney. Um, on the CFM leap, I think, you know, they're a little more advanced. But again, I don't think that it's, a, it's comparable yet to the five Bs and the seven Bs. Um, but yeah, I think clearly time will tell. I think another point worth making is on the GTF advantage, you know, does that solve the issue of time on wing when that enters service? I think that would certainly be the hope of many asset owners and operators. Um, certainly they've come to market with some information on fuel burn benefits, uh, but sort of we wait to see what benefits can be seen from time on wing. But yeah. on the GTF as well, I think also worth mentioning in a, you know, the way the LLPs work um, I don't think, you know, then, you know, it can compare to the V2500, for instance, it hasn't got a, you know, a standardized 20,000 cycles across the stack. And in the HPT, these are lower. So, you know, for let's say if you've got a V2500 engine, you know, particularly a lower thrust engine that, you know, is doing one to ones, 1 1.2 to one, so 1.2 flight hours to, uh, to flight one flight cycle. You know, that engine of E2500 might, you know, get somewhere into the upper teens. So 17,000 cycles, 18,000 cycles. I'm a little conservative. David may say it'll get to the 20,000 cycles, but those engines are not going to re reach those echelons. So there is, you know, a disadvantage there already. But I think across the board, if Pratt can reach sort of the 10,000, 12,500 cycles in the HPT, that would be comparable to many um, V2500 operations, particularly those with a higher flight hour to flight cycle ratio. And, and is a uh, on-time uh, 
performance heavily dependent on the operating environment for these new gen engines or is it yeah, yeah i mean yes but it, again it's you know it, you know in some cases it, there's proving beyond that i think just getting a bit of consistency in service again on the pratt and whitney would be would be would be helpful and i think we can then ascertain the full picture um, i think there's just too many fixes and issues going on to really get a you know a solid run certainly the engine is performing better undoubtedly in benign environments there's no question about that and i think a lot of the activity has been related to upgrades to the combustor uh, throughout sort of since eis on the on the gtf but yeah that would be sort of my concluding comments on that okay and how do you guys foresee the uh, architecture and timing on the next generation jet engines? All right, I think um, yeah, it's it's gonna it's gonna require a big step change in technology to get people there. So um, I'm going with some recent polls that I've seen, which you know we're looking at maybe 2035 or something like that, Nils. Um, I think that's when people are going to need to like that's that's when that's how long it's going to take to get to that 12 to 15 percent. You know the fuel burn incremental improvement that everybody's looking for in order to justify um, the, you know, the, the next step. Like I think at the moment, um, and I'm not just flying the flag on the mature engines here for the sake of it, but um, I think when, when CFM and Pratt were pricing the economic gains, gains on these engines, you know, they were basing it at $100, um, $100 fuel barrel costs. And that hasn't, um, you know that we're not quite there at the moment, so that somewhat that erodes some of those um some of those fuel burn gains. So you know I, I think yeah I think you know to answer your question into the into the twenty thirties and I think we're seeing that on some of the um the residual value betting that we're seeing in the market and some of the new tech aircraft. But is that going to be a combination of the geared fan and the leaps hot section, or is it going to be an unducted fan? I mean, what 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 is that out there? Maybe the unlocked fan. I'll, I'll, I'll defer to Kane on that. Um, yeah, I mean, listen. Certainly, there's the, the CFM rise, um, and again, you know, these are, you know, sort of, sort of. I remember when I was sort of getting into this industry and learning about things, sort of, sort of open rotor, and then this is sort of transformed into the CFM rise program. You've got Rolls Royce with the ultra fan, which you know has had its own test bed developed. It's been in testing. It can be scaled down. It's been designed at higher thrust to, to begin with, with the intention that it can be scaled to fit a future program. You know, the new CEO is, is keen to get involved in the narrow body space again. Um, I think back to the original question as well, Nils, you know, remember that engine manufacturers spend a lot of money and R&D on these new engine sort of so the likes of the gtf the likes of the leaps the likes of the trent 1000 tens and there has to be a period where you know they, they they make something back and i think you know it all also falls into a time period there too i appreciate that there's perhaps greater pressures particularly from a an environmental perspective and meeting targets but equally um, you know, there is sort of particularly money to be made in the aftermarket for the engine manufacturers, which is traditionally where they make their money having sold engines at a loss. All right, great. Thank you so much, uh, Kane and David, uh, for that. And uh, thank you for everybody who dialed in to listen. And uh, it's not time to go to the beach just yet, because next Tuesday we have another learning lab. Uh, on, on the topic of EV tolls. So you're more than welcome to dial in for that. See you back. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Nils. Thank you. Thanks, Nils.